Good morning, and welcome to Christ Church this morning. This morning we have a beautiful sunny day, and we have this word from the Lord to welcome us to, to worship. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach the end of the earth. That's from Isaiah. Thanks everyone for joining us both here and online. And uh, if you're expecting Milan today, well, uh, we've got two people to replace him. So thank you very much. We've been um, packing bags at the beginning of the service to um, uh, act as our act of service um, because worship is not a noun. Worship is a verb. And a lot of things go into worship. It's the music and it's the prayer and everything, but it's also acts of service. And so if you're able, I invite you to go over and pack bags for our local kids who need uh, weekend food bags. Um, if you would like to stay seated, we encourage you to spend some time in prayer for the kids and for the teachers and for their families. Um, but that's over there for you, so. invite you to stand as we start worship, the music part. Oh 
As believers, we have the opportunity and, in fact, the privilege of going to God with our sins and confessing them to him. Please join me in this prayer of confession. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Listen to these words from the Psalms. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as far as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us.
morning. I have a couple of announcements to make here uh, just this morning. Uh, one, um, there's a trivia night tonight um, that's online, I believe. Um, pretty fun thing. I've done it, you know, last time or whatever. Had a good time with it. It's not so hard, you know, like I got like some of the questions right and, you know, I'm not, you know, even remotely interested in trivia, unless it's about, you know, pop culture, something like that. So, um, but, you know, if you want to hang out with the rest of the congregation in an online fashion, uh, in a way that's easy and entertaining and fun and whatnot, then I think, you know, this would be a good thing. So I would encourage each and every one of you to contact Kevin or Jenny. They're the ones that kind of have all the keys to this one um, and can get you in line if you will allow me to make that pun. Um, also, um, on, a, on a more serious note, this links thing over here that we do um, is a fantastic thing, right? There are a lot of um, people that rely on that, I think, on a, on a weekly basis. But there is a problem with it in that the funding for it uh, has reached like a critical low level. And to maintain that, um, we're going to need to restock that fund. And so Carol has gone through the trouble of, um, <laughs> of making something that might stick in your mind um, and to help you remember. I would encourage you um, to figure out a way to help this cause. I know I'm going to do that too. Um, it can be done in a multiple, uh, you know, like a variety of ways. One way would be just to put an extra thing in the collection plate as you come by here, you know, if that's, if that's your style. If your style is more computer, I think there's ways to give online. And if you're either one of those things, then again, talk to Jenny. Uh, she's the wizard of all these types of things. She can um, get you connected with the right people in order to make funding for the Lynx program happen. But, uh, but this is a thing that we do. This is a thing that's vital to not just the people uh, that we're serving, but it's vital to the uh, relationship that we have with God here in our church. Our church is to serve. Um, and this is one of the ways that we do it. And it, it's at a point where we need to really look into it harder. That being said, that's all the announcements, I think. Um, we get the opportunity to pray. Uh, and so I would invite you to pray with me before we start digging into this scripture here this morning. Father, we love you. Um, we give you great praise for the God that you are, the God that is so big, so powerful, so strong that you care for everyone, that you care uh, for this world around us, you care for us individually, you've gone through the trouble to make everything that we have and we give you praise for that. We love the world that's around us too, Lord, but the world is hurting. And we want what's best for it in whatever fashion that should happen to be. And so on global levels and on personal levels, um, on hidden levels and on public levels, Lord, we just pray um, that Christ Church and the individuals of it would know your will 
that we would know your desire, the thing that is in your heart for what's happening in the world and the communities that are around us today. And that we would fall in line with that to become part of your movement in the societies that we live in, in the societies that we know. Lord, we pray that we would be your instruments and your tools, that we would be able to share your love with the world around us to the glory and to the good of God. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So, I am um, the first of two preachers this morning. Um, but before we do that, um, I've got to, to say like three things, just three quick little disclaimers, if you will, uh, to kind of set the tone for what I'm going to do up here. Um, first of all, um, today, you know, speaking in football terms, I'm really just the guy who like catches the ball and puts it on the tee. The next guy that comes up here is the guy who's going to kick it through the uprights. So if you're going to pay attention to somebody today, I'm not the guy. I mean, I would love for you to hear what I have to say and whatnot. I think that it's important. But, um, but if you're going to catch the message, you got to pay attention to this next guy who comes up. He's, he's going to be the one that drives it home. A second one, though, is that I am in kind of an odd, kind of an unprepared, kind of a, you know, kind of a wing it type of uh, mood. And so today I'm really determined to just kind of have some fun with what's happening up here in the scripture. So, you know, I'm sorry, but uh, you're going to see some of my, um, some of my more casual personality today instead of, you know, the drone uh, type of preacher that I can sometimes be. My vision of this passage also might be a little bit skewed, like I, I have a way that I think this looks. It may not be actually how it looks, and I'm just going to pray that you guys will have some grace for me with regard to all that um, so that um, we can get through this thing and I can kind of lay out, you know, the, the feeling and the emotion for what I think is happening in the passage here today. And I have a job for these guys over here, so I don't know if the camera's following me over here or not, but I'll trust that it is and see what happens. You guys over here, can I ask you guys to do um, me a favor? I need young voices today, uh, somewhere along the line. If we're going to have fun with this, at a certain point in the this, in this sermon, and maybe at two points in the sermon here, I'm going to say something like, can I get a boom? And at that point, I'd like you guys to give me just a real nice, loud boom type of a thing. Can you guys do that? want to practice one time? We got one over there too. So can you, can you guys do that? Would you mind helping me out? Just give me a I need a boom. Oh, that's what I'm talking about right there. Okay, so now I think we're prepared to get down into this scripture. How many people here have seen the musical Hamilton? Like five. Oh my goodness, maybe six. All right, so haven't seen the musical Hamilton. Um, I would recommend it even if you don't like musicals. It's a little... Um, the music is a little bit more modern, um, that kind of thing. Uh, the costuming, though, is spectacular. The artistry is out of sight. Historically speaking, the show takes some liberties, but overall, it's extremely memorable and entertaining. I really enjoyed it. The story is about the early days of the Revolutionary War and the formation of the country, particularly with Alexander Hamilton's role. Now, somewhere early in the second half, and then again later in the second half of the show, that character, Hamilton, gets involved in a, a cabinet battle. Um, it's basically a formal debate of all the cabinet members with George Washington, and um, his adversary is Thomas Jefferson. Now, this is a sung debate, right? So in that musical battle, Jefferson lays down his argument in, um, in books and whatnot. They'll call that a polemic. Um, and that's like really old language for what he's... Um for what he's doing there. But he lays down this argument uh, about everything that he thinks that is wrong with Hamilton. And he does it in such a succinct and convincing way that you think there could be no rebuttal against it. It's a real kind of um, drop the mic moment uh, that ends in a statement. You know, and the statement is, you know, and if you don't know, Mr. President, now you know. Can I get a boom? That's what I'm talking about right there, right? So for some, for some, it'll be a stretch for me to relate any part of this musical to any part of a scriptural passage. 
But I was reminded of it today when I read about Stephen's story. Either because I've seen the show and heard the music so many times that it's kind of always, you know, playing somewhere in my head, or that maybe there's actually some similarity between the show and what we're reading here today. But that being said, let's take a look at what's going on in the story of Stephen. I'm reading from Acts at the beginning of chapter 6. This would be um, verse 8. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of freedmen, as it was called, and of the Syrians, and the Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. They had secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set false witnesses against him who said, This man never ceases to speak words against the Holy Spirit, the holy place, and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change customs that Moses delivered to us. We have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw his face was like that of an angel. And the high priest said, are these things so? And Stephen said in reply, I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit because um, the passage then is like the rest of chapter 7 and it kind of, there's a lot to read there, and I don't think um, we have time for me to read that as slow as I read. So I'm going to paraphrase it. He says, Stephen says this. All right, people, listen up. It's time for a history lesson. Our father Abraham, all those years ago, was told by God to move to a new land. And eventually he settled in a land that you guys are living in here today, and he did not have the wealth that you all possess. In fact, he lived this way until he was blessed with a child, Isaac, and then circumcised him in obedience to his covenant with God. Joseph um, then came, and then the 12 patriarchs, who were jealous of him, so they sold him as a slave to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. God was with Joseph, however, and he became a great leader who saved our ancestors from a great famine. After Joseph died... After Joseph died um, I lost my place on my page here. A new king arose in Egypt and enslaved our people and killed our children. Moses was born at that time, one of our own, who was saved as an infant and grew to be a powerful man in Egypt. Moses, when he was around 40, decided to visit our people. He saw one of his fellow Israelites being abused by an Egyptian and he avenged him. The next day, Moses came, to the two, came up on two other Israelites who were fighting, and he tried to break it up, and they rejected his leadership, and then they threatened him. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. So he fled. And 40 years later, this same Moses, blessed and directed by God, returned and saved our ancestors from Egyptian captivity. He performed signs and wonders. He received the Ten Commandments from God and gave them to us. But our ancestors refused to obey him, and instead they rejected him, and in their hearts they turned back to Egypt. So they created idols for themselves and worshiped false gods, just like the prophets said they would. And after that, David would lead our people, and his son Solomon would build our temple, but truly understood that the Most High does not live in houses made by human hands. And then he closes his little speech with this. I'm going to read this directly uh, from the passage here. And at the end of it, I'm going to need another one of them booms. You guys on? Here we go. Stephen says, You stiff-necked people, 
uncircumcised in your hearts and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered, you who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Can I get a boom? Boom! Boom! And he drops the mic and says, and if you don't know, Mr. President, now you know. One more, come on. Thank you. Why is it that people resist the prompting of the Holy Spirit and the call of God? I'm sure that a Google search would reveal all kinds of insightful scientific reasons and all that kind of stuff. But I want to share with you just a couple of things that particularly affect me today. We're talking about why people resist the prompting of the Holy Spirit and the call of God. For me, probably the biggest one, and I think probably the biggest one that's happening here today based on some of the stuff that we reread earlier in that little speech, was the idea of preconceived notions. Sometimes the movement of God does not match up with my perception of who and what he is and how I've responded as a result. I believe that preconceived notions are a big factor in the biblical story here today. The people of that time were prepared to follow a military, political type of Messiah that was going to rescue them physically and set up a kingdom under man-made notions, man-made models. And what they got was something totally different. And this difference between the reality and their preconceived notions, I believe, is a major factor in their rejection of the movement of God. I've seen this problem play out in my life, though, also. I'll just give you a small example. In a, a recent um, elders meeting, uh, we were talking and planning about the prayer retreat that's, um, that's coming up. And... Um, after everybody had said a bunch of, you know, really smart and wonderful things and whatnot, I had said to the group there, I'm like, hey, maybe we should, you know, provide some, like, child care or whatever so that um, the, the families of the church can come and attend the, um, the, the prayer retreat, and they don't have to worry about their kids or whatever. Um, and uh, Mylon, who's just a really good pastor and a nice, gentle soul, um, told me, he says, um, well, you know, honestly... Um, why can't the kids just, you know, participate in the whole thing and we can kind of, you know, do things that families can do also? Um, and I thought to myself, wow, this, um, <laughs> this is an important uh, moment for me. I didn't realize that um, families could and probably should pray together <laughs> and that a prayer retreat could be done in such a fun way it, um, it caused me to reevaluate my personal biases towards prayer retreats, actually. It was a small thing that made me wonder, what kind of blessings am I missing out on, particularly related to prayer, because of a preconceived notion of what a prayer retreat might look like. But I think it happens all the time for us in Christianity. We have our views of what religion, what, what, what the church, what Jesus looks like. But I think we need to open up our minds to possibilities for fear that we might miss Jesus like the story is going to show. Another reason for me is anxiety over releasing control. And I'm not going to talk long about this. Everybody knows what the deal is here. A moving God would have us move with him but we have no control over where it is that he's going. And so as a result, to move with God would mean that we have no control over where we're going as well. And this leads to all kinds of faith and trust issues. Coming back to our biblical story. Stephen lived in a time in a society that for whatever reason or reasons, 
was resistant to the prompting of the Holy Spirit and the call of God. And they proved it by killing Stephen and then missing out on who Jesus was. We may not live with the same physical threat that Stephen did, but we do live in a time in a society that for whatever reason or reasons is resistant to the prompting of the Holy Spirit and the call of God. And as a result, many are missing out on Jesus. Including us. So, there we are. I wonder if there's some other aspects of this story that we missed. I wonder if there's some other things that have a bearing on whether or not we hear God's voice. It's time for that, time for that field goal kicker. Thanks, Danny. Danny's a humble guy. He doesn't realize what a tough act to follow he really is. But anyway, I'm going to talk a little bit about Stephen himself, okay? Because uh, in our scripture week today, it's the story of St. Stephen, right? In fact, it's the whole story of St. Stephen. Uh, and it points something out to us, and that is, to me anyway, that it points out how one person, a single person, can influence things, can influence history, in fact. And it also tells us how we can be an influence. So who was this guy, Stephen, anyway? We don't know. We don't know a lot about him. He's never mentioned outside this story. Here in Acts, when they're choosing people to be deacons uh, for the early church, it says, quote, they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. That's a great resume, right? Yeah, I wouldn't mind if that was said about me and if it was said about all of us. But beyond that, we don't know much about Stephen at all. We know that his name means crown or wreath, which leads some people to speculate that it may not have been his birth name, that it might have been a, like they gave him this nickname of the, the crowned guy because, he was, because of what he did, right? Because of his, his mission, right? Sort of like when, they called, when Jesus called uh, Simon Peter the rock, right? We don't refer to him as Simon ever, but Peter, yeah, that, that stuck. It's a nickname. So it's possible, we don't know because we, we just don't know, but it's possible Stephen went by another name earlier on in his life. We don't know. So then, okay, who is he, right? He's not one of the big 12, not one of the 12 disciples, right? That's for sure. He isn't named in any of the accounts of those disciples. And it was the disciples, remember, the 12, who said, um, you know what, we need some help here. We need some deacons to distribute uh, food to people. So he wasn't one of that group, right? So he may have been one of the very first believers, though. I mean, uh, in Luke chapter 10, Jesus sends out 72 people to preach to the, to the surrounding area. He might have been one of the 72. He says, we don't know when, when, Peter, when Stephen joined the church, but we know what happened when he was unleashed, Right? Because when Stephen was commissioned as a deacon, he was a force to be reckoned with. Acts says that he did, quote, great wonders and marvelous signs among the people. And again, we're a little impoverished on the specifics. We don't know specifically what happened. But it does seem that it would be remarkable. I mean, here, even in the early church, they're saying he did great signs and, uh, and he gets special mention, Right? And the other thing that happened is it drew attention to Stephen. And Stephen then, through these actions and through what I speculate was his growing popularity with the people of Jerusalem, he drew the attention of some of the leaders of the Jewish people there. Notably, these weren't men of the temple at this point, not yet, but members of a synagogue that was comprised of people who were originally from other lands. They came from the African coast, Cyrene. They came from Egypt, Alexandria. They came from what, places that were now in, uh, what, what are now in what we would call Turkey, uh, the ones called Cilicia and Asia. Those were, were provinces in Turkey. And these guys, these people, 
were very committed to what they saw as keeping their faith pure. Okay? They heard Stephen speaking, and maybe they saw him work some wonders. We don't know. But they understood that something was changing in Jerusalem. They saw that this one guy, Stephen, was persuading people through his words and actions that a new faith was in their midst, in their, midst, in their presence. A new way of thinking about God. One that wasn't in line with the traditions and the customs of the traditional Orthodox Jewish faith that they knew. And it was taking hold in their beloved Jerusalem. And they did not like it. At all. This one guy, this one man, this Stephen, was upsetting everything they believed in. Everything they had devoted their lives to. Everything they loved, right? They could not let that stand. So they decided to do something about it. They tried arguing with him and failed. Stephen answered their arguments with persuasive arguments of his own. So they did what desperate people do in circumstances like this. They made up some lies about Stephen. And these lies were pretty close to what he was actually saying. So, you know, maybe, maybe that's what he... Anyway, they made up these lies. And they got some people to repeat those lies in front of the proper authorities so that they could drag Stephen up on charges of blasphemy and insurrection. The Jewish religious court was called the Sanhedrin. And they're the ones that were going to hold Stephen's trial. Now, I, I want to point out something that's very different about our culture and the culture in first century Jerusalem, right? Uh, the Sanhedrin was a body of religious governance, right? But in Jerusalem at that time, it was more or less a theocracy. That was, the religious law was the law, as long as that didn't oppose the Romans. You didn't want to get the Romans angry because they had a big army they could bring down on you. But as long as you played the game with them a little bit, as the Sanhedrin did, things were okay. And it was, it was more or less God's rule there, or as God's rule as they thought they saw it. The, um, in our day and age, we, we kind of have separated the church and the state, so it's hard to really imagine someone going to trial for blasphemy, although that has happened in the past in the, in the U.S. and long ago. But it's also hard to think of any religious court of ha as having any kind of uh, authority over a legal matter. I mean, the, the elders in this church, if we decided something like that, the legal authorities would be like, what are you doing? Yeah, we don't know. Anyway, back to the state. It was the case that they were the legal authority in Jerusalem in the first century. And the point is, uh, the charges against Stephen were very serious charges. They may not seem like that to us, but they were very serious. But then, this one guy, this Stephen, he's not who they expected him to be. First, there was his face. The face like that of an angel. Now, I'm not exactly sure what that means, right? Uh, given that sometimes angels seem pretty frightening, and if you, if you want to know what I'm talking about, read the book of Ezekiel. Okay? But I imagine what they're saying here is that Stephen looked peaceful. He looked serene. Maybe even confident. And as Denny pointed out, Stephen tells these Jewish leaders their whole history, but from his Christian perspective. And that left a bad taste in their mouths. The Jewish leaders did not like being equated to their ancestors, especially with the idea that those ancestors had rejected the very people that were sent by God to help them. Many of the people that were rejected were sent into exile like Moses or outright killed like some of the prophets. The sand, the, these people did not like being equated with that. But there's another side of the story of Stephen, the, the one that he told, rather, uh, and that's the story of Israel, the story of how Jesus fit into that older story. In his story, Stephen points out the power of one person. The power that is when one person chooses to obey God, even if it doesn't make sense to the people around him. That's the power. 
that he's talking about. Did it make sense for Abram to leave his hometown and head out to an unknown land just because God told him to do it? Not from our perspective. And I think from the perspective of those Jewish ancestors, it didn't make much sense either. But God used that one person, Abram, to change the whole history of the Middle East. Did it make sense that Joseph would be rejected and thrown in a pit to die? Only to resurface again years later and save his whole family? No, that didn't make sense. But God used that one person to change the fate of the nation of Israel. Generations later, Moses was rejected and tried to, when he tried to save the Hebrew people and hid out in the desert for 40 years. Then he came back and led them all back to their homeland and got rejected again. They're at Mount Sinai. But eventually, he led them back to their homeland and it changed the course of the history of Israel. To us, this makes no sense. But again, God used that one person to do all of this. So we know what happened to Stephen, right? The one person in our story, right? Uh, let me read the passage to you, starting, uh, starting with the, the mic drop. You guys got another mic drop? Ooh. Boom! Thank you. All right. This is, uh, again, Acts, uh, we're going to pick up right after he tells them that they received the law and didn't obey it. When they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul was there, giving approval to his death. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house, dragged men off and women and women and put them in prison. So Stephen is killed, and no more is said about him in the Bible. In fact, his death is the beginning of a, of a great persecution of the Christians in Jerusalem. People are scattered to the hills, to Samaria, even as far as Antioch and Damascus, which were far, far away cities, even as far away as Rome, just to get away from the persecution brought about by the Jewish leadership. The persecution that, by the way, was led by this guy, Saul, who held the coats while Stephen was stoned. So, what was Stephen's real impact then? Anything? Well, from the beginning, it looks like the outcome of Stephen's life is kind of neutral at best, or maybe even negative for the church. Because he died and his mission was incomplete, right? But yet, because Stephen died, and the Christians did scatter. And now there were believers in Antioch and Samaria and Damascus and so on and so on. And even throughout the whole Roman Empire. Yeah, there was persecution there for sure. But the leader of that persecution, Saul of Tarsus, and Tarsus, by the way, is a city, I learned this this time, I, I never knew this. Um, Saul, uh, Tarsus is a city in the Cilicia province that was mentioned before, that this was the synagogue of people from that province. So... That makes sense, right? Wow. Anyway, <laughs> but he had seen something that he's never going to forget. He saw someone looking into the face of God. And later, when his turn came to, to go face to face with Christ, he knew what Stephen had seen, and he reacted accordingly. See, we consider Saul's conversion to be this one-time event years later on the road to Damascus. But I wonder if the seeds for that weren't sown right here. When Stephen looked at God, 
with the face of an angel and asked God to forgive his attackers. Saul, even Saul looking on this, couldn't ignore the peace and serenity that Stephen exhibited at that point. So the impact of this one person, this Stephen, whom we actually know so little about, went well beyond his encounter with the Sanhedrin and his death. The power of one man, right? I don't think Stephen would agree. Oh, he'd agree with the idea that there's one person's power exhibited in his life. But I think he would disagree that it was Stephen. The voice he heard, the face he saw, the one person that he would say that was at work here was, wait for it, right? Jesus. Yeah, I know, that's the Sunday school answer, right? It's the obvious one coming from someone here at the pulpit in church. But Stephen and those who he touched through his witness and actions, that, to him, that one person was Jesus. The one the scriptures foretold and the one that, yeah, people rejected, who should have known better. They rejected him and killed him. This was the one whose presence the Sanhedrin could not abide. Notice in the story how they only lost it when Stephen said he saw Jesus sitting at, right hand, at God's right hand. That's when they lost it. They're like, ah, we can't take it anymore. This guy's got to go. Stephen consistently pulled the spotlight away from himself and focused it on Jesus. He did not want to be the focus of people's admiration or adoration. He wanted his Lord to be the only one that people would turn to. He was convinced that the one everyone had missed was actually the one that they were waiting for. So the question that Denny pointed to, the question of how do we live without missing Christ, it's still hanging up there. It's still hanging over us, isn't it? How do we know it's you, Jesus? And how do we help others to see you? I think that we know Jesus just like the people around Stephen knew him. By looking at his works. By looking at the witness of people who claim to know him. Are we as certain as Stephen about our faith in Christ? Do we show it? Stephen did signs and wonders and put his knowledge of the scripture to work when it counted. Do we? Now, I'm not saying that to shame anyone. Believe me, I fall short on the issue of scriptures all the time. And signs and wonders, I don't know, you know. But maybe, maybe we can change that. Maybe we can learn about the scriptures. In fact, I'm sure we can. I mean, maybe you even learned something today. I don't know. I sure did. I learned a bit about Paul and Cilicia and all that. Anyway, it's a, it, I love trivia. That's why. <laughs> Maybe the signs and wonders part are a little different than what we assume, too. I mean, what's a bigger sign than loving someone who doesn't feel lovable? What's a greater wonder than someone who gives up their life for someone else? When we help, even though it costs us time and money, when we serve without looking over our shoulders to see who's watching, when we love with no expectation or even hope of being loved back, then we're working the signs and wonders that have been assigned to us. Because then we're doing the things that Jesus commanded us to do. We're pointing others to that one person, the one that we're looking for. <laughs> We've created a thing. I'm glad for it. Today we get to celebrate that one that started the change. And we get to celebrate the idea that we only have to be one of his in order to have 
furthering effect of that change on the world. And so we can celebrate that today by gathering around this communion table. It's, it's a table of celebration for us um, where we get to enjoy uh, the fruit that uh, the Lord has, has given us, which is each other. And we get to do it as we remember him, which he told us to do that. On that night that he was prayed, uh, in that last supper, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, take and eat, all of you. This, this bread is the, my body broken for you. Every time you eat this, do so in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup, which is right here, and he poured it out and he said, this cup represents my blood poured out for you. It's a sign of the new covenant between me and you. And that every time you enjoy this, do so in remembrance of me. People of Christ Church, the elements are prepared. The time is now. The time is now for us to celebrate. I would invite you to come and do that. from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt
invite you to stand and sing this chorus with us. Saul of Tarsus. Now, to him who is able to do immensely more than we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.